Welcome back. In this video, I want to talk to you about unity of form. What I mean by unity of form is that there is a sense of coherence or completeness across an entire essay. That means that everything in the essay belongs or is made to belong. It's relevant or is made relevant. And that this is largely accomplished through formal means, the form of the paragraph, the form of the sentences, the organization and arrangement of ideas. That's what we mean when we're talking about form. And if an essay is unified formally, it will be easier for your readers to focus on what, be, what is being said. It will be easier for your readers to stay engaged with what you're arguing. And that's largely what unity of form is all about. We want to motivate our readers to stay with us throughout the entire argument. And we want to maintain their attention. We don't want them to try too hard. We don't want them to have to work too hard to decode what we're saying. Formal considerations will enable you to do this. So what are the requirements for unity of form? What are we talking about? Well, you are probably all familiar with the three parts of the essay, the three basic parts of an essay. You have an introduction, you have a body, and you have a conclusion. The purpose of the introduction, what it does is capture the, the audience's attention, pose an interesting problem, and prepare the audience for what's coming. That's the purpose of an introduction, basically. It's what an introduction does. And it is how an introduction motivates a reader to stay with the argument and how an introduction sets up the formal expectations of the rest of the essay. Next is the body. The body develops the ideas that the introduction introduces. And it moves through those ideas in an orderly fashion. There must be a sense of organization and order if the reader is to maintain their attention. But more than that, it respects the audience's time. It, is, it respects their willingness to listen to what's being said. If you respect your audience and demonstrate that respect through what you write and how you write it and through a strongly organized, orderly essay, your audience is more likely to respect you in return, even if they disagree with you, and stick with you through your argument. Finally, the last thing is the conclusion. If there is to be unity of form, you need a conclusion that reinforces the importance of what's been said. It means you've got to refer back to it and it needs to address how what's been said is going to be useful or valuable to the audience. They need to be able to leave this essay, leave this argument, thinking that they have been given something that's worthwhile to them, something that they can put into practice in their everyday lives. So these are the two principles of unity when we're talking about unity of form. First, motivation. Readers need to be presented with a problem or, a, or a, a question that's intriguing, something that's going to capture their attention. As they begin reading the introduction and as they move through the essay, readers need to recognize a writer who cares about them. Even if they disagree with the writer and even if the the writer is telling them things that might be uncomfortable, they need to recognize that the, that the writer cares about them. And by cares about them, again, I'm not necessarily stating that, they have, that the writer has to agree with everything they believe, not just necessarily flatter their presuppositions or their biases, but by care about them, I'm talking about on the formal level. The sentences have to be interesting, maybe to some degree entertaining. There has to be an order to things so that the reader doesn't get lost or that the reader isn't having to work too hard to make sense of what the writer is arguing. And finally, the reader needs to see that the writer is actually doing their job. Different genres of writing present dif different roles 
for writers and readers to perform. So when a reader comes to a particular genre, whether that's a, a, an academic essay or a news article or an opinion piece or um, a history essay, whatever it is that you're, that, that's being written, the reader needs to have a sense that the writer is performing their duty to the reader because that's what writing is. As a writer, you have a duty to your audience. And if you are unwilling or unable to perform your role in the life of the reader, the reader will not be motivated to stay with you and will not follow along. The second principle of form, of unity of form, is global coherence. And these are two terms I'm taking from Joseph Williams and Joseph Bizzip's style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace. So motivation is what keeps the reader going Global coherence is the idea that the reader sees the relevance of everything in the text. Everything is there for a reason. You're not just being thrown information. Um, and the reader sees that this text is organized in an orderly fashion, that there is a, a logical arrangement to things. And again, this is important because the reader should not be expected to do your job for you as a writer, the writer's job is to make the reader as comfortable as possible in terms of decoding ideas. And if the reader is uncomfortable for any reason, and, and a disorganized essay is a part of that, they will not be, they will, they won't keep going. They, they won't stay motivated and they won't be able to get anything out of what you're writing. And this then is the key, right? Readers go to writing to get something out of it. Your job as a writer is to respect them enough to give it. So let's start with introductions. Um, there are three parts and four purposes to an introduction. The three parts are the hook, the problem, and the thesis or the main point. Uh, the four purposes of an introduction are to catch the audience's interest. Remember, your job as a writer is to engage your reader to present the problem or question being addressed, to provide the needed context for that problem or question. So to show why it's relevant, why it's important in the life of the reader, and then to provide some kind of an answer to that question or a solution to that problem. Um, and there are two basic ways that writers tend to handle this. They will either state their answer outright or they will imply it. So. Three parts, the hook, the problem, the thesis. The hook gets the reader's attention. It draws them in, engages them. The problem piques the reader's interest. It lets them know that this is going to be something important to them. And the thesis anticipates what's coming. It tells the reader, all right, this problem that I just posed, I have a solution. Now the reader knows what they're getting into as they go in. Let's talk first about the hook. This is also called the exordium. It's the prelude to the entire essay. And so your opening lines are extremely important. This is what draws your reader into the text. Think about a movie, the opening moments of a movie or the opening moments of a play. I've always been impressed by the opening moments to William Shakespeare's Henry V. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. What a great opening line. Um, I've always been impressed by uh, Stephen King's opening to the Gunslinger novel, his, the first in the series, the, the, um, the, Black, the Dark Tower series. The Man in Black fled into the desert, and the gunslinger followed. What a great opening. That is a great opening line. Opening lines are so important. Your hook catches your audience's interest, but it can't just catch the audience's interest. It can be irrelevant to everything that's coming after that. The hook, and this is what makes a good hook really, really good, is that not only does it pique your interest, but it introduces the topic. It sets 
everything up. It prepares the audience for the tone and the nature of the argument. Those opening lines are, that's a key move. And there are four ways that, that some, some kind of, you call them cliched ways, but cliches work for a reason. Um, there are four standard ways that, that people often start an essay. Um, so if you can't think of any other way to start an essay, try one of these four, four types of opening or four types of hook. Ask a question. State some fact. Um, use a quote that is relevant to what you're talking about. Or an anecdote, a story, a little short story that's relevant to what you're, you're talking about. Something else. So once you've got that hook down, when, once you, you start moving into the opening paragraph of your, of your introduction, you've got to come to a point where you, you state your problem. But you can't just state your problem, just kind of drop it down there, right? You have to prepare your audience. You have to build on shared values with your audience or, or a shared context. And then you've got to transition into the problem and your position on the problem. And one way that really good authors often do this is they will use what I like to call the butt move. There's lots of ways to do this butt move, um, as you'll see in these examples here. But essentially, the move is this. You begin with a widely held assumption, understanding, or idea. You begin with something you believe your, your audience shares with you. Then you use the butt term, some kind of a butt term, and then you challenge that idea or assumption. Look at these examples that I have here. Effective writing, they're all variations of the same thing. And the reason for this is because I wanted to show you different ways that you can use the but move without actually using the term but. But essentially, all of these are doing the same thing. And once you start seeing, you're gonna see it everywhere. Once you understand this but move, you're gonna see it everywhere. So. Effective writing is a fundamental skill required of professionals, intellectuals, and citizens alike, but few students dedicate much effort to mastering it. Do you see that butt move? Look at how it changes in these next two examples. Despite the fact that effective writing is a fundamental skill required by professionals, intellectuals, and citizens alike, few students dedicate much effort to mastering it. Notice that by using the term despite, at the beginning, I'm setting my reader up in advance for the butt move. So they're waiting through the entire uh, first clause of this sentence for that butt move to come. They're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Effective writing is a fundamental skill required of professionals, intellectuals, and citizens alike. Although few students dedicate much effort to mastering it. Notice that the term although is similar to but, but it's gentler, right? But is harder than, gen than, than although is. However is another example that, that, that you can use. So I want you to get a, get a feel for this butt move. Start using it in your introductions. And the reason the butt move is so effective is because readers are motivated. Remember, that's one of the key principles of the, uh, the unity of form is motivation. Readers are motivated to read something that promises to solve a long-standing, difficult, or intriguing problem, answer a fundamental, probing, or insightful question, challenge assumptions, biases, accepted ways of thinking, or widely held beliefs, or ways of doing things, or unfortunately, that promises to flatter them by challenging someone else's assumptions, biases, uh, accept the ways of thinking, etc. Or that promises to show that something is missing in our understanding, that a new perspective on something can help us better understand an old problem or an old situation. All of these are examples of the kinds of challenges essay writing is designed to provide their readers. And all of these kinds of challenges will, will establish at the beginning something to motivate your reader to stick with the essay and a focus for the essay that will provide a sense or can provide a sense 
of global coherence, relevance to everything else you're talking about. Now let's talk about the different types of introductions. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's a for a novice writer or even for an established writer, this provides some great ways to think about how to open an essay. I am taking this list from a book called Classical Rhetoric for the Modern Student by Edward P.J. Corbett and Robert J. Connors. This is from the fourth edition of that book. It's a great resource. I highly recommend it. So first off, let's start by naming these five introductory types. Inquisitive, paradoxical, corrective, preparatory, and narrative. Let's get into what each one of these means. An inquisitive introduction asks an interesting or provocative question. Notice that was one of the ways that we already talked about uh, to motivate your reader to stick with an essay. But the goal here is to offer an interesting, unanticipated, or provocative answer to that question. Let's look at this as an example. Why, one might ask, do universities place so much emphasis on writing? When university education is increasingly just a glorified vocational training, and considering most occupations don't require nearly as much skill in writing as English teachers like to suggest, why waste students' time, and even threaten their grades and their future livelihoods, to train them in what amounts to a largely useless skill? Notice the questions. These then are provocative questions, especially for somebody in a writing situation. Yes, that is my dog in the background. <laughs> Notice these questions. These are, these are provocative questions. And the questions themselves build on a set of shared experiences or values. Anybody who's going into the university knows that they're going to have to do a bunch of writing. So right off the bat, this begins by connecting with something that the audience is probably already going to be interested in, or at least grounding it in a shared experience. So the questions aren't just random. They're actually directing where the essay is going. And notice what happens after you ask the questions. Right after you ask the questions, you need to provide a provocative, interesting answer. Well, writing instruction is not and never has been about job training. Writing instruction is and always has been about soul craft and as such eloquence is necessary to the common good so you have this interesting question why do we focus so much on writing um, particularly when one could argue it's a largely useless skill in the modern job market which i don't agree with by the way totally think that's wrong well because uh, uh, writing instruction has never been about job prep. It's always been about becoming more human. It's always been about training citizens for the common good. So that's an example of an inquisitive introduction. You start with an intriguing, interesting, provocative question, and then you offer an interesting, unanticipated, or provocative answer. Great way to open an essay. Now let's look at the paradoxical introduction. A paradoxical introduction shows that propositions or points which seem incompatible or contradictory are actually not. So you have two things that seem to contradict each other. And you're pointing out that not only do they not contradict each other, but they actually support or complement one another. Let's take a look at what this looks like in practice. So here's an example of a paradoxical opening. Sometime after graduation, many students will discover that their careers require very little of them in terms of writing. And so they will deem all that time they spent writing in college as largely a waste. But the fact that writing isn't necessary for their career is the very reason why writing is so important. So notice what's happened here. With this author, what's happened is that they've taken the experience of going into the workforce and not having to write very much and the experience of all that writing in college and the person might assume that these things are incompatible why did i spend all this time writing when it's not helping me in my job and what this writer has done is said 
No, that's the point. It's good because it doesn't help you in your job. It's good because it's not job focused. So again, a paradoxical introduction shows that a proposition or that propositions or points which seem incompatible with each other, which seem to contradict each other, are actually not contradictory at all. So let's take a look at what a corrective introduction looks like. Here is an example of a corrective introduction. Because a university education is increasingly nothing more than a glorified vocational training, and because most occupations do not require nearly as much skill in writing as English teachers like to suggest, one might conclude that writing classes are a huge waste of students' time and money. Such conclusions, however, would be wrong. So, what this writer is doing is beginning with an assumption that somebody might have about writing instruction at the university level and then pointing out that that assumption is wrong or that that conclusion that they've come to is wrong. Again, that's the point of a corrective introduction. It asserts that something has been misunderstood, misinterpreted, or misrepresented. In this case, in the case of this corrective introduction example, it's entirely possible that this essay would move forward to state all three. Let's look now at the preparatory introduction. A preparatory introduction is slightly different than all of the other introductions that we've looked at so far. Um, what you're doing in a, in a preparatory or preparatory introduction is explaining that your argument will develop in an unusual manner. So essentially what you're doing is you are preparing your reader for something that's going to happen over the course of your essay or over the course of your introduction. You anticipate, perhaps, some potential misunderstanding or misunderstandings that the reader might have regarding your topic or regarding your argument, or perhaps, and or perhaps, you apologize for either that misunderstanding or apologize for some shortcoming on the part of yourself as the writer or uh, uh, apologize for uh, some shortcoming that you perceive in your information or your sources or what have you. The, the point here, the goal of a preparatory or preparatory introduction is to prepare your reader for some perceived misunderstanding, some perceived flaw, or some unusual development that's going to happen in this upcoming essay. Why don't we take a look at a preparatory introduction in practice? By this point in history, students must be so very tired of hearing how important writing instruction is. And so I would like to apologize in advance for this little essay, which is yet another treatise in, the, in a long list of treatises addressing the unparalleled importance of not only learning to write, but learning to write well. Notice that what this writer is preparing their reader for is something that they've heard a thousand times, which is that students should learn to write and should learn to write well. Notice that a preparatory or a preparatory introduction is a great way to ingratiate yourself to a reader if you think that what you're about to write might challenge their biases, might challenge their presuppositions. So it's an interesting way to perhaps flatter your reader at the same time as disappointing them. It's a really advanced move. Finally, there is the narrative introduction. And just as it sounds, a narrative introduction is an introduction that opens with a story or an anecdote, a parable or an allegory, a fable, some history, some detailed re retelling of an event, whether in your personal life or, or out in the world somewhere. This is the narrative opening. And you have probably seen this many times over the course of your education. Let's take a look at a narrative introduction in practice. Once upon a time, there was a little boy, let's call him Jack, who never wrote a word of his own. Handsome as he was, he discovered early in his education that he could always get someone to write for him. First his mother, then his girlfriends. Teachers always let Jack's assignments slide, either because he was so sweet or because he was so sly, or because they were <clears throat> simply too overworked to care about one solitary boy who didn't care himself. 
Eventually, when Jack discovered ChatGPT, he was ecstatic. Now he would never, ever have to write a word himself. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Things do not end well for poor Jack. Notice something that happens here. So this is a completely, obviously, completely made up story. But it's designed to be a kind of fairy tale opening to obviously an essay about learning to write. Something I want to draw your attention to here is another example of the butt move that we discussed earlier. Look at how the shift happens towards the end of this little narrative. Eventually, when Jack discovered ChatGPT, he was ecstatic. Now he would never ever have to write a word himself. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Things do not end well for poor Jack. Notice that you can use the but move without ever using the word but or any of its related terms. There is no, the but is implied here. It's insinuated by the turn that happens, by the challenge that happens. And as you look back over all of these introductions, one of the things you're going to notice in each one of them is the challenge. One of the things that keeps readers motivated is that challenge. You establish a status quo and then you challenge the status quo. That, as long as it's interesting, motivates readers to stick with a piece of prose. Now at this point, I want to take just a moment to talk about one other thing that every introduction has to do. The introduction has to introduce you, the writer, to the reader. And if the reader is going to be motivated to stick with an essay, they have to be interested in you. It's not enough to just have something interesting to say. You have to present yourself as someone your reader will want to spend time with. This is an idea that I take from a guy named Wayne Booth in a book that he wrote, The Company We Keep, The Ethics of Fiction. The idea that Booth gets at is that every time a writer writes, they are asking the reader for their time. The only non-renewable resource in the world is time. You can't get it back. Once it's gone, it is gone. And so you as a writer have an ethical responsibility to your reader not to waste their time, not to be the kind of person they would not want to spend time with. And this brings us to the idea of the ethics of writing. In every writing scenario, in every rhetorical situation, you are going to have a role that you perform in relation to your reader. More often than not, that role is predetermined. If you're a journalist, your role is to state the truth, which is why so many people right now are angry at journalists because they're all a bunch of agenda-driven propagandists now. Very few of them are actual journalists anymore. Teachers, you have, an, you have an obligation to teach. You have a role to perform in the life of your students. As a writer, you have a role to perform, or depending on the genre, a variety of roles to perform. You have to figure out what that role is, because that will determine what you do and what you say in your essay and how you say it. And the reader is going to anticipate that and expect it based on the kind of writing that they're coming to. This is something that has been referred to as the performance of self or the development of character ethos in ancient rhetoric. And the strategies that you use for developing ethos are called ethical proofs. So you keep the reader interested, not just by what you're saying, but by who you come across as while you're saying it. You need to do your job perform your role. You need to acquire an authoritative voice. That means that you you use the language, whatever you're writing about, you need to learn that you need to learn that language. Whatever discipline you're writing in, whatever topic you're writing about, you need to come across as knowledgeable about that. You need to develop a personality in your writing. This is a great reason to study style, studying sentence structure, studying word choice, being precise in your word choice, studying how you can use rhetorical tropes, how you can write more balanced, how you can employ syntax, how, can, how you can um, transition effectively. 
but also how you can organize your phrases and clauses in order to give your writing personality. You need to come across as trustworthy. If a reader doesn't trust you to tell them the truth, they're not going to buy anything else you say. As a writer, as a public speaker, as a citizen, you need to come across as trustworthy. You also need to be interesting. And finally, there's shared values. Uh, you have to find places, even if you largely disagree with your audience, on some very key points. You need to figure out what values you do share and build on those. Because if you completely ignore your audience's values, you lose them. They will not be motivated to stick with you because they won't trust you. So you need to show readers that you value their time, their interest, and their values. You need to show them some respect, and you do that largely not only from the way you handle your information, but through the way you organize your sentences, the way you organize your phrases and clauses and develop a writerly voice. So what motivates a reader to stay with a writer over the course of a composition? So far, we've discussed what motivates a reader to get into a piece of, of, of writing. But what motivates a reader to stay with you? What motivates you them to keep going once the introduction has piqued their curiosity or piqued their interest? What motivates people to stick with a piece of writing is when they pose an interesting or important question that needs to be answered, when they pose an interesting or important problem that needs to be solved, and then they provide an answer or provide a solution. And when they promise in that introduction to explain why that answer or solution is a good one, is relevant to the life of the reader, is important or significant in some way. This is how the introduction motivates the reader to stick with an essay long term. It promises certain things to the reader. Every reader is going to come to an essay with one big question already in their mind, even if they don't realize it, even if they're not doing it consciously. This question is still there. It's always there. And that question is, as you can see, so what? Why should I be reading this? Why should I care? Your job is to answer that question. And often you're going to have to answer it over and over again throughout an essay. You need to make sure over the course of an essay, not just in the introduction, but throughout the body of the essay, you need to make sure that you are constantly answering this question so that your reader does not lose focus. The reason for this is because no topic, uh, no, no amount of information is inherently interesting. A writer's job is to make the topic interesting, is to make the information interesting. You need to communicate why your topic is important to the reader, why they should be interested in it. And one way you do not do this is by telling your reader you should be interested in this because. That is a surefire way to lose your reader's interest. There are probably exceptions to that. Almost every rule you will ever hear in writing, there are exceptions to. But uh, by and large, the answer to that so what question has to be implied. And the way that you imply the answer to that so what question is by knowing at the outset what problem or question it is you're trying to solve and why that problem or question should be important to your reader. Let's take a look at two example paragraphs. And I want you to think about which of these actually answers the so what question. Let's look at this first one. In college, students do a lot of writing. And not just in English classes. Most college classes will regularly require some form of writing, from reading notes, summaries and responses, to essays, proposals, and reports. Writing is a big part of the university experience. When you read that paragraph, you come away essentially asking the so what question. So what? Now notice some things that are going on here. You've, you've definitely got a shared context. That's great. Um, you may kind of sort of have a problem. Um, the idea that students do a lot of writing, but if that's the problem, it's not explained why it's a problem at all. And because there's no real problem stated, there's no, there's no solution to the problem. There's no solution being offered. Basically, all we're being given here in this paragraph is a bunch of things that college students do regarding writing. It's an information dump that doesn't do anything. And so I come away from this writing experience asking, so what? So college students do a lot of writing, so what? So compare that last example to this one. Uh, and as you read this, ask 
ask yourself, does it answer the so what question? Effective writing is a fundamental skill required of professionals, intellectuals, and citizens alike, but few students dedicate much effort to mastering it. In fact, most college students hate writing. The reading notes and summaries and responses, the research essays and proposals and reports. But all that writing isn't just a bunch of busy work. It's designed to ensure that students master the most basic skill one must master to perform effectively in the public sphere. And like all forms of expertise, mastering writing isn't something that just happens. Someone can teach you the principles, but mastery requires self-directed, engaged learning. If a student approaches writing as anything other than an apprenticeship and a core public value, it's not just his grades that will suffer. Society suffers as well. And ultimately, the whole point of a university education is lost. So, as you read this, as you look at this selection, how might you answer the so what question? Is this an, uh, an example of someone just dumping a bunch of information on you? No. It begins like the other one did, in a shared experience. That's good. What is the problem? The problem is very clear. Students tend to hate college writing, but their hatred of it is a misunderstanding about the significance of writing, the centrality of writing, what it is we're trying to accomplish in the teaching of writing. So, so what? Writing is far more important than you think it is, and not just for getting good grades. That's the, the answer to the so what question. Why should I be interested in this? Because this is a writer who's saying to you, I'm going to tell you in this essay, the rest of the essay, this is just an introduction, I'm going to tell you in the rest of this essay why writing is so important and why it's so important for you as an individual to take it seriously. There is nothing like that in this introduction. There's no problem being expressed here. There is no answer to the so what question. Now, it's not just the fact that this is a longer introduction, although its length matters. Because it's longer, the writer was able to present a problem and present a solution to the problem, or at least imply a solution to the problem. But at the end of reading this, the reader is certain why this is important. The reader knows what the writer wants them to get out of this. You need to be able to do that. You need to be able to answer in advance the so what question, knowing that your reader is already asking it before they start reading. So, in order to motivate a reader to stick with you through an essay, your introduction has to answer the so what question. It has to provide three important things. A shared context, a meaningful problem or question, and a solution or answer to that problem or question that acts as your main point, your overarching claim, what we call your thesis. Now, Let's talk for a minute about establishing a shared context. Um, as I said, one of the things that motivates a reader, one of the things that an introduction needs to do is establish this shared context. How do we do that? What are some, some strategies for doing that? Well, a shared context could be based on an event, maybe a recent event. If you wanted to write, for example, about um, uh, the earthquake quakes that are happening in Turkey, if you wanted to write about um, transgenderism being taught in the schools, um, if you wanted to write about the cost of a college education, um, if you wanted to write about the transition from combustion engines to electric cars, these are events that are happening right now. And so current events are a great way to establish a shared context. But historical events can do this as well. You can choose a moment from history. Um, you can choose a shared cultural experience. The university experience is an example of that. Uh, growing up poor and white in, in the rural South might be a shared experience. The immigrant experience is a shared experience. You might start with shared beliefs. These can be shared moral beliefs. Uh, we have a tendency in the Western world to believe that laws should protect people from, from harm. So somebody writing in defense of gun control 
often will start there, that unregulated guns are um, um, making us unsafe. And it's the government's job to secure domestic tranquility. If you are writing about the morality of abortion, for example, beginning in shared beliefs, a feminist might begin in shared beliefs about female bodily autonomy. A Catholic might begin in shared beliefs about the, the worth of unborn children and the need to protect them. You can talk about commitments. You can talk about influences. Pretty much anything, social, political, cultural, economic, moral, religious, aesthetic, philosophical, or ideological can be used to establish a shared context with your reader. Now let's talk about meaningful questions that you could ask. And I've talked about this in another, uh, another video, so I'm not going to go too much into this. I encourage you to go and, and watch my other video on um, asking questions. But there is a difference between a simple question and a probing question. This isn't to say that simple questions, so, uh, questions that have an either or response. Is abortion wrong? Do homosexuals have a right to marry? Should the United States be engaged in the war in Ukraine? These questions have a simple yes or no answer. They're an either or answer. And the problem with them is almost invariably when you ask them, you already know the answer to the question. More intriguing questions can be asked if you ask probing questions. Who, what, where, when, how, why. Why in particular is a fantastic way to start an engaging, intriguing investigation because you're trying to figure out some sense of meaning. Another way to ask meaningful questions is to approach it through what's called stasis theory. Um, stasis theory is a framework for asking questions in order to begin arguing. Uh, in order, to, we call it invention. In order to invent an argument, you have to ask the right kinds of questions. And stasis theory directs a writer or an arguer towards questions of fact, questions of definition, what is the nature of a problem, or how are we going to call it, what are we going to call it, questions of quality, how important is it, and questions of policy, what do we do about it. So these are some great ways to ask meaningful questions. And remember, meaningful questions motivate a reader to stick with you over the course of an essay. If your introduction promises to answer a meaningful question or solve a meaningful and intriguing problem, your reader is likely to stay motivated with you. Let's talk for a minute about problems. So we've talked a little bit about questions. Now let's address the, the idea of problems. With every problem that a, a writer is going to pose, there are basically two parts. You have the condition or situation, how things currently are, or how things will be, um, or how things should be. That's the condition. And then you have consequences or costs. There is, there's a price to be paid. Something is going to happen. Those consequences could be good. Those consequences can be bad. The cost can be good, the cost can be bad, but for every problem, these two things are happening. There is a condition or situation, and there's a consequence or cost to either leave it alone or change it. We also have two types of problem. There's a practical problem and a conceptual problem. Practical problems ask, what should we do? A practical problem addresses something that can or needs to be fixed or should be fixed. It asks, what should we do about this problem and how do we fix it? A conceptual problem asks, what should we think? It's a situation where there is in some way a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. And so the condition or situation in a conceptual problem demands that we increase our understanding or change our understanding if there's something that we are misunderstanding. Notice that, that and, and the introduction of misunderstanding really draws attention to this. But notice that there is not necessarily a clear line between these two things, right? 
Yes, a practical problem is what should we do? Yes, a conceptual problem is what, we, what should we think? But in every practical problem, there's understandings going into it. What should we think about this in order to do uh, this particular thing, to fix this particular problem? Um, with a conceptual problem, we need to fix our lack of understanding, or we need to fix a misunderstanding. So these are not as clear cut as the terminology uh, makes it out to be. That being said, this is a great way to think about the two options available to you when you're trying to decide what kind of a problem you're going to present to your reader and you want the handle in a piece of writing. If you can figure out whether or not you're dealing with a conceptual problem or a practical problem, that helps you decide what you're going to write, how you're going to write, um, what kinds of evidence you're going to need. The vast majority of academic writing is conceptual. The vast majority of public intellectual writing is practical. So that stuff you read in the newspapers, the opinion pieces and that kind of stuff, that's almost invariably practical. They see a practical problem, the situation demands a solution, and there's a there are consequences to not solving the problem, there are consequences to solving the problem, and there's a cost to solving the problem and a cost to not solving the problem. That almost invariably is what you're dealing with when you're looking at public intellectuals and their writings. Academics, if you go and you read academic prose, if you are, are in college and, and, and you have to do a, a research essay and, and you are looking at a lot of academic writing from scholarly journals, the vast majority of the problems scholars deal with are conceptual in nature. There is a hole in our understanding that needs to be filled. And academics are offering ways to fill it. This should help you as a writer because if you find yourself in an academic course being asked to write an academic essay, you need to know this. You need to recognize that you're being asked to develop and address a conceptual problem and not usually a practical problem, whereas the vast majority of novice academics want to handle practical problems because it's what they're familiar with. So just keep that in mind. This is a great way of understanding, one, that practical problems and conceptual problems are not as distinct as the terminology makes it look like, make it, makes it appear to be. But having access to this this discourse, this terminology, allows you to understand what might be expected of you in a given writing situation. And if you're writing in academic con contexts, almost invariably, you're being asked to address conceptual problems. What should we think? What are the consequences of not changing our thinking, not developing a new way of thinking, or not correcting a misunderstanding? And what are the costs that are going to be required of us to address that misunderstanding or to improve our understanding? This brings us to thesis statements. So once you have established a shared context, once you have established a problem and you know what kind of a problem you're dealing with, once you have kind of figured out that your reader is coming into a piece of reading, into a piece of writing rather, with that so what question already looming over them, you have to be able to address the thesis statement as an answer to a question or a solution to a problem. Note, a thesis statement is not the question or the problem itself. This is not what thesis statements do. Now that's not to say that a writer, and you'll see this, you'll, you'll see writers do this often, where they ask a question in the thesis statement space, at the, at the climax of their introduction, which is usually where your thesis statement should come. Almost invariably, your thesis statement needs to come as the climax of your introduction. Remember what I said, every rule that I, that I state here, there's, there's going to be a good ex exception to it um, because writing is really about principles and not about rules. Um, but as a good rule of thumb, your thesis statement should come as the climax of your introduction. Let's say you get to the climax of an introduction and a writer that you're reading asks a question. This is a rhetorical strategy. Do not be deceived into thinking that the writer does not know the answer to that question. It's just a rhetorical strategy. It's, it's designed to pique your interest and keep you interested. But it's kind of an advanced move. So I would suggest be careful using it. Often, novice writers will ask a question at the climax of their introduction because they don't know the answer to the question. That is not a good way to go into an essay. 
If you don't know the answer to your question, and of course here I'm talking about a finished draft and not a rough draft. It's a great thing, it's a great thing to do in a rough draft and then figure out what the answer to the question is and then go and revise. But you need to figure out the answer to the question. You need to know what the answer to the question is as you move into your essay because you need to be able to provide your reader with a firm foundation to walk on as they stroll through your essay. If they don't have that, they not only won't stay motivated to keep moving through the essay, they may come to distrust you. So your thesis statement should be the answer to a question or the solution to the problem that you are posing in your introduction. Thesis statements need to be concrete. They can't be vague. You, you, you can't say things like, writing has always been important to people. That doesn't tell me anything. So what? So what if writing has always been important to people? Notice how we could change that and make it more concrete. Developing your skill as a writer is important if you plan to play the role of a professional, an intellectual, or a citizen. That's far more concrete. We now know that this thesis statement is going to direct us to talk about very specific public roles where writing is important. Your language needs to be precise. Precision in language is actually one way to help make a thesis statement concrete. Notice what I just did. I, 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 I moved away from the vagueness of writing is important, has always been important for human beings, um, to something very specifically narrowed, very precise language. Um, uh, it is important for success. It is important to be effective. That's precise language. But it's also narrowly focused, right? For professionals, intellectuals, uh, citizens. These are very specific statements. So you want your thesis statement to be concrete, precise, narrowly focused, and specific. Now, it's funny because... A lot of students, if they get too specific, too focused in their topic, they're afraid they won't have enough to write about. This is one of the paradoxes of, of making claims. Um, the more precise you are, the more specifically focused you are on something, the more you will actually find to say, right? If I were to take that same thesis statement talking about professionals and, and um, intellectuals and citizens, and I were to just focus on citizenship. Writing is a fundamental skill that is necessary in the performance of one's citizenship. And a poor writer cannot be a good citizen. That's a very, very specific, precise claim. Why do you need to be a good writer to be a good citizen? If I were to generalize that a little bit more, if I were to, 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 to take a broader view Writing is a very important skill to participate in the public sphere. Notice that I'm not as grounded there. What role in the public sphere? What part of the public sphere? Are you talking about being a businessman or are you talking about being an academic or are you talking about being a politician? What do you mean by the public sphere? Notice that while that does, to some degree, expand what I can possibly address what I can possibly talk about. The problem with it is that I don't know what I'm talking about. It's extremely vague. I have nothing more to say because the public sphere is just too vague. Um, I heard this compared once. A former colleague of mine used the example of being in a helicopter and trying to describe a field full of cows. If you're looking down at a field full of cows, there's not a lot you can say about a field full of cows. It's just a field full of cows. Um, but imagine that you focus on one part of the field. Let's say you're looking at the cows that are by a tree in the field. Well, now you can describe what those cows are doing. You know, you can describe how many of them are, maybe what kind they are. Um, are there some sitting down? Are there some standing up? Are there some in the shade? Are there some out of the shade? Now focus in even more on a single cow. You suddenly have all kinds of things that you could talk about. You can talk about the cow's color. 
name, sex. You can talk about what specifically they're doing, how they're interacting with other people, where they're sitting, how they're sitting, where they're going, what they're doing. You suddenly have all of these things that you can talk about just by focusing narrowly on a single cow. The more focused you get on your topic, the more paradoxically you've actually find to talk about. So you want thesis statements that are concrete, precise, narrowly focused, and specific. You do not want thesis statements that are just a random topic, gun control, that's not a thesis statement, that are vague, the public sphere, writing is good for the public sphere, that are overly general, people should all learn to write, or that is too broadly focused. We need gun control to protect people. These sorts of thesis statements are very ineffective and they will not motivate a reader to stick with you through an entire essay. Now let's talk about conclusions. A conclusion is what everything in the essay is working up to. It's the climax. This is the payoff. Getting here is what you're motivating your reader to do. This is why you want your reader to stick with you through the entire essay. For this reason, a conclusion has to have some kind of emotional payoff. There has to be some emotional or intellectual or spiritual or moral or social or cultural or ideological payoff at the end of an essay. I have some types of conclusions here. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is four ways, four standard ways that writers often end their essays or conclude their essays. One, you can summarize what you just said. There are some disciplines in academe that actually require that. That's what a, a conclusion is. Um, but another way to do this is to echo your opening. Joseph Williams and Joseph Bizzup in Style Lessons in Clarity and Grace use the musical term coda here. You can offer a call to action. Um, get your reader to do something. You can answer the question, now what? Now that you've, you've told your reader all this stuff, now what do you want them to do? Now what do you want them to see, think? What do you want them to do with this information? How do you want them to implement it in their daily lives? For a conceptual problem, this should involve the new understanding that you want them to have. Uh, let's say, for example, that you are um, trying to understand a controversial issue. If you're looking at both sides of this controversial issue and you're engaging in a conceptual approach to this controversial issue, the last thing you want to do is just get dragged back into the debate. You want to try and transcend that debate. You want to develop some conceptual way of looking at the deba debate that helps people better understand the debate. So think about something like gun control, right? Um, we have for or against. People are saying it's constitutional, it's unconstitutional. What if we transcended that debate and would argue something like, well, yeah, gun control is to a degree unconstitutional, but if you look at the Constitution, libertarians on gun control have a tendency to focus just on the liberty to bear arms. It's a fundamental right. But what about promoting the general welfare? What about establishing justice? What about ensuring domestic tranquility? These are other reasons that the government was established. And so a conceptual way to address this might be that without changing, if you believe in gun control, without changing your opinion on gun control, one might be able to approach this problem from the, the, the perspective of many people, not all people, but many people who defend the right to bear arms are assuming that the right to bear arms is the only important right. And they're ignoring the fact that there are these other reasons that the government was established. Now, I'm not saying that's right one way or the other. Another, what I'm saying is that we have conceptually risen above the debate, even though clearly we have a position on the debate. We have conceptually risen above the debate. What might I do in a conclusion if my question is now what? In a conclusion to an essay like that, I might argue or I might assert something like, um, I am not saying that we need to eliminate the right to bear arms. But if we are going to ignore all regulation, then we're ignoring these other roles the government was set up to perform. And we need to be aware of this in some way. How can we both preserve the right to bear arms and empower the government 
to establish justice, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty, um, and ensure domestic tranquility. Skip that one. How can we do this? Notice how this answers the, the now what, right? The now what is simply asking your reader to figure out, to accept this as the next, the next stage in this ongoing conversation. We need to figure out this next stage. We need to figure out how to allow the government to do everything that the Constitution says the government was designed to do. That's an example of a now what conclusion for a conceptual, an essay that addresses a conceptual problem. All right. Now let's talk about revising our introductions or revising our essays for motivation, to address the principle of motivation. We've talked about all this stuff that motivates readers to stick with you in an essay. If you've already written a draft of your essay, you immediately have to start thinking about how you're going to revise to motivate your reader to stick with you. So, first question you need to ask, what's my specific problem or question? What is my essay actually designed to address? What problem am I trying to solve? What question am I trying to answer? And how am I defending that, right? How, how am I supporting my answer to that question or solution to that problem? Am I posing a practical problem or am I posing a conceptual problem? And you might also ask, what sort of problem does the actual assignment I've been given require me to, pro to pose if you're doing this in school? Um, am I performing the role I was called upon to perform? You may get into a revision of your essay and realize, ah, oh, crap, I am addressing a practical problem and I was supposed to address a conceptual problem. Well, there's a couple of ways to do this. You can, you can try to transform a practical problem into a conceptual problem. Remember what I said, practical problems are more conceptual than the idea of a practical problem implies. And conceptual problems are more practical than the idea of a conceptual problem implies. That's one way to address this in revision. If you've written, if you're supposed to be uh, addressing a, a conceptual problem and you've addressed a practical problem, how can I change this practical problem into a conceptual problem? Another way to do this is uh, uh, to consider if you're doing a practical problem and we're supposed to write about a conceptual problem, consider the conceptual elements of the practical problem and place them in your introduction or address them and it, at some point in your essay, you may, you may do this as you move toward the end of, of the essay. Just add a section that says, now, some of you might think that what I've been dealing with this whole time is a practical problem, but that's not, that's not entirely accurate. Um, what I'm actually addressing here is a conceptual problem. Think about the gun control thing that I just addressed. Um, while certainly any proponent of gun control is attempting to address a practical problem, a student or, or a writer writing about gun control and drawing on the concept of the Constitution and the concept of constitutional rights may point out that while this is a practical, this is a practical problem with a practical solution, um, what I'm really trying to get at here is the conceptual nature of this practical problem. So that's another way to address that. Um, lastly, you could just keep going with the practical problem and hope your professor just doesn't grade you down for it. All right, the next stage to revising for motivation. Uh, look for the three parts of your introduction. Remember, uh, your introduction has three main pieces to it, right? It's got a shared context, you've got a, a problem or a question, and you've got your main point, your thesis. Can you clearly see these in your introduction? Let's go back to this example. If you were to reread this, and you were revising for motivation, you could immediately point out that there is no real problem being presented here. There is no answer or solution. There's just a shared context and a bunch of information given about students who do writing. That's not useful. We want to revise it to some degree to get something more like this. So you need to put in a problem. You need to put in your solution. If you're revising your intro, the best way to do this is to go read your essay. What problem are you actually addressing in your essay? And put that into your introduction. What is your answer to the question or your solution to the problem? Figure that out 
and then write that as your thesis statement. You might also consider the four purposes of introductions. Does your introduction capture the audience's interest? Does it present the problem that's being addressed? Does it provide the needed context for that problem, explaining why that problem is a problem, why it's important? Does it state or imply your solution to the problem or your answer to the question? You might also consider looking at the different types of introductions. Consider completely revising your introduction to be one of these types. Inquisitive, paradoxical, corrective, preparatory, or narrative. I encourage you to go back and watch the sections of this video that discuss each one of these and maybe choose one. The next thing to consider as you're revising your introduction for motivation is look for your butt move. Is there a butt move? Does it come right before your challenge to some kind of a status quo or some kind of assumption, some kind of a bias, some kind of a shared, shared idea or shared thought? The other thing to look for when you're revising your introductions for motivation is where does my introduction end? This is basically a nice way of asking what's my thesis statement. But there should be a, a somewhat clear line between your introduction and the beginning of the body of your essay. Your reader needs to understand, needs to see clearly where the introduction ends and where the body of your argument begins. Something else you can do when you're revising your introductions for motivation to see if you're motivating your reader to stick with you. Think of dividing the problem that you're presenting into two parts. What is the condition? Ask yourself if you're dealing with the right type of problem, practical or conceptual. Remember that a practical problem ex exacts a concrete cost and a conceptual problem addresses something unknown not understood or misunderstood. It's addressing a hole in our knowledge. The goal is to understand something better. And each of these different types of problems has a different kind of cost. So, so the so what question is going to be different, slightly different for each type of problem. Um, with a practical problem, the so what question, the cost is concrete. Um, and the consequence is going to be a condition of unhappiness if the problem isn't solved. Or, you know, the problem will persist if the problem isn't solved. Um, the consequence, the happy consequence, will be that the problem will be fixed. With a conceptual problem, uh, again, there's some intellectual, social, ideological, cultural, ethical cost if we fail to better understand this issue. But there's also a cost to understanding the issue. We may have to give something up. We may have to dedicate ourselves to changing our behavior, changing our mindset. So figure that out. What is the condition? What is the cost of the problem that you're addressing? This will help you revise your, in, your introductions to motivation for motivation because you will want to ensure that this is clear to your reader. Again, a word of caution. Just saying the words condition and cost are not going to be very helpful to your reader. You want to develop a writing style and a writing strategy that more implies these things. Think about this opening again. What is the condition? Well, the condition is the students don't like writing and they don't take it seriously. What is the cost? The whole point of university education is lost. Society suffers. The individual suffers. There's more to writing than just getting good grades. Notice that this writer never used the words condition or cost. What this writer does is imply the condition by presenting a shared context and imply the cost by discussing the consequences. So we've handled the unifying principle of motivation. Now I want to move on to the second principle of formal unity, global coherence. Remember what we said at the beginning. Global coherence is when the reader sees the relevance of everything in the text. They see that everything is there for a reason. Global coherence is also when the reader sees an orderly arrangement of information. So everything ties back to the thesis. That's relevance. Everything's there to show that your answer to that question or your solution to that problem is a good one, is a strong one, is a reasonable one. But they also see that your presentation of the information has been arranged in an orderly manner so that it's easily digestible, so that they can follow your train of thought. 
this should tell you that one of the ways to create a sense of global coherence over the course of an essay or a sense of formal unity is to forecast your themes in advance. That's, that's really what an introduction is designed to do. You're introducing the themes of the essay and the rest of the essay needs to address those themes. It needs to stay within the same thematic context. Now, if you're going to start revising for global coherence, let's say you read your essay and you want to make sure that you have a well-organized essay that is arranged so that the reader is able to digest this information effectively, that they are, so that they are motivated to stick with the essay, it's to stick with the argument, and so that they see the relevance of everything that you're saying. One way to start doing this is to organize your essay into discernible body sections. If you're writing an essay that hasn't been organized in this way in advance, then one of your goals in revision is to organize it this way. And I suggest that the classical argument structure provides a very strong general framework to impose order on your thoughts on your essay. Keep in mind that individual assignments from different professors or from different teachers may ask you to do something different. But if you are entering into a writing scenario and you haven't been told how to organize your text, I highly encourage looking at the classical argument structure. I won't address that here. You can look that up um, online. I also have a video on it. But I highly encourage learning the classical argument structure because the classical argument structure forces an essay to do everything a good essay should do. Uh, have a strong introduction, um, present what other people have said on the topic, uh, take a strong position, address counter arguments, uh, and then close in a, uh, a strong way. The next thing that you should do in terms of forecasting themes is make sure once you organize your essay into sections that each section begins with a segment, a paragraph, a few sentences that introduces that section. So keep in mind that if you're addressing your essay in chunks, each chunk, each section of your essay should kind of have a mini thesis statement to it that, that tells your reader everything you're going to be doing in this part of the essay that forecasts your themes, that forecasts your purpose. You also want to end these opening segments, so that opening paragraph or that opening few words. You want to end those opening segments with a climactic statement. You want to state the point of the entire selection. So in the same way that the introduction to your essay works up to a climax and presents your thesis, these opening segments to each section of your essay should also work up to a climax that presents the point of that particular section, that establishes the themes for that particular section. And then you make sure that section stays on point, that it does not deviate from the theme or the purpose of that section. Finally, you'll want to conclude each of these body sections with a mini conclusion. Go back and look at the, the different types of conclusions that we have, right? The summary, the echo or coda, the call to action, the now what move. But at the end of each section, these mini conclusions will also act as transitions into the next section. By forecasting themes in this way and by maintaining a thematic unity over the course of the different sections of your essay, you can create a sense of global coherence for your reader. You also create a sense that there is an arrangement to this. There is an order to this that allows your reader to follow your train of thought. Another way to revise for global coherence is to ensure that you are repeating the key terms and phrases that were introduced in your introduction and that were introduced in the opening segment of each section of your essay. The goal here is to ensure that you are repeating these key terms and phrases over the course of a section and over the course of an essay. What that does is create a sense of thematic coherence for your reader. Finally, you want to make sure that each of these sections is organized coherently. Order the sentences, the paragraphs, and the sections in a way that, that your reader can easily follow your train of thought. Look at your sentences in each section. 
make sure that each one is relevant to the section and to the overarching purpose of the essay. Does everything tie back to your thesis? Does everything in a section tie back to that opening segment of the section? You want to think about all of these strategies like background or context, explanation, expansion, interpretation, analysis and synthesis of sources, evidence, facts, data, examples, other supporting reasons, alternate point of, points of view, uh, address counter arguments. All of these strategies are ways that you can ensure that sentences within a paragraph and then paragraphs within a section are coherent over the course of an essay and create a sense of order and intelligibility for your reader. Finally, just as you do with any essay, you want to make sure that each section of your essay has a clear beginning and a clear ending. Having that opening segment that introduces the themes, having that closing segment that concludes that section but transitions into the next section. This is a great way to give each one of your sections a sense of completion, a sense of unity, a sense of wholeness, but also to tie it back to the rest of the essay, which is what gives your entire essay global coherence. Motivation and global coherence are the two important principles that you need to understand and you need to master if you are going to give any of your compositions a unity of form. I want you to study these principles, put them into practice, go look them up online, study these principles. I promise you that as you dedicate yourself to this, you will become a better writer. Talk to you again soon.